When I was in my early 20s, I lived in a student residence, away from my family. I didn't go out much. I typically spent my evenings drinking beers and watching TV alone, though occasionally my roommate Brad would join me. One summer night, I was drinking and watching sports when Brad came in and started talking about a viral trend, the Charlie Charlie Challenge. He explained it was like a homemade Ouija board, using just paper and pencils. Curious but a little uneasy, I agreed to give it a try, figuring it couldn't hurt. After a few more beers and some small talk, we set up the game by turning off the TV, lighting candles, and drawing a simple grid with yes and no on a piece of paper. We placed two pencils on the paper and waited. The atmosphere was tense as we sat in the dark, and we began asking questions. To our amazement, the pencil moved to yes when we asked if Charlie was there. Encouraged, we continued asking more trivial questions, and the pencil kept moving back and forth. But things took a strange turn when I jokingly asked, is Brad going to die? Brad snapped, furious at my question. He immediately started yelling at me, grabbing me by the collar and acting like I'd done something serious. Despite my attempts to apologize, he wouldn't calm down, and when the pencil pointed to yes, confirming the question, he completely lost it. Brad angrily flipped the table, threw the paper and pencils, and stormed off to his room, slamming the door in my face. I was confused, wondering why he was so upset over a silly game, and I thought he'd cool off by morning. I cleaned up the mess and went to bed, unsure of what had just happened. After I managed to calm down, I went to sleep, but later that night, something woke me up. At first, I thought it was my imagination, but then I heard it again. A strange thudding sound that kept repeating. It was very late, and I had no idea what could be causing it. Brad was the only other person in the house, but he had never stayed up this late before. Curious and a bit scared, I decided to investigate. I got out of bed and stepped into the dark hallway, feeling a chill of fear. I stood there for a few moments, listening, and realized the thuds were coming from Brad's room. I cautiously walked over and pressed my ear against the door, hearing the noise more clearly. Something was definitely happening in there. I knocked on the door, calling out to Brad, but he didn't answer. The door was unexpectedly unlocked, and I quickly tried to open it, but as I did, I tripped over a pencil and fell. Panic set in as I started crying uncontrollably, thinking the worst. The thought that my question about Brad dying might have caused this flooded my mind, and I felt overwhelming guilt. I lay on the floor for several minutes, crying and screaming, until everything went quiet. That silence was even more terrifying. Then suddenly, a horrifying, almost demonic version of Brad charged out of the room. This unsettling experience seemed to parallel a disturbing news article about a 20-year-old who allegedly passed away in Alba City, Libya. Medical sources mentioned the connection between the Charlie Charlie game and the incident, with some families suggesting that the game might be linked to the tragedy. Authorities in Eastern Alba blamed the Charlie Charlie game for allegedly encouraging conjuring activities that led to the deaths of victims. As a result, they imposed a ban on the game. However, despite the investigation, public confidence in the authorities' actions faltered after the game went viral on social media. This led the authorities to announce that they were continuing their investigation, although many questioned the effectiveness of their response. Growing up in the Dominican Republic, I came from a poor family, and I often spent time with wealthier kids to experience the things they had. One of these friends was Eddie, whose parents were very wealthy. One day, Eddie invited me to his house while his parents were out of town. He wanted to try the Charlie Charlie Challenge, a viral internet trend that resembled a cheap version of an Ouija board, answering only yes or no. Initially, I thought it was silly, just two pencils and a piece of paper with yes and no written on it. Despite my reservations, I agreed to participate. Eddie suggested we try it at night, claiming it was easier to summon spirits then, and although I was nervous about messing with witchcraft and voodoo, 
I couldn't shake the growing unease as I prepared to leave for his house. It was too late for me to back out as I made my way to Eddie's house. I took the bus to his neighborhood, walking through the quiet streets until I reached his front door. I knocked and waited, wondering if I had come all this way for nothing. After a brief pause, the door opened and a guy named Diego introduced himself, inviting me in. The house was unusually dark, and Diego explained that spirits preferred the darkness. He led me upstairs, where Eddie was preparing for the Charlie Charlie challenge. I questioned why we were doing the ritual in the attic, especially with all the candles, and Diego explained that Eddie had downplayed the seriousness of the game to keep me from backing out. Despite my reservations, I reluctantly agreed to participate, and we started the game. As we began asking questions, the pencil moved, confirming that something was happening. I was nervous but tried to keep going with the game, even though I feared that Charlie might be an evil spirit. As the questions continued, the atmosphere became tense, and I began to feel uneasy. When the pencil moved to indicate a response to one of our questions, things took a dark turn. Suddenly, the ritual spiraled out of control. There was a fire, and chaos erupted in the house. I panicked as I realized things had gone terribly wrong, shouting for Eddie and Diego, trying to get out of the house. The situation quickly escalated, and all I could think of was getting to safety. The story draws inspiration from a chilling news article about an incident at Juan Pablo Dart Primary School in the town of Atomayor, Dominican Republic. The article described how three students allegedly became possessed after playing the Charlie Charlie game. Their parents, convinced that their children were under the influence of the devil, kept them home from school. This event took place in a region known for its association with voodoo and black magic, and it sparked a widespread panic about a so-called satanic craze. The situation left the community in fear, but there have been no updates or further reports on the three students since the mid-2000s. At the time of the incident, the Charlie Charlie game was a viral trend, gaining popularity online. Though I had heard of it, I didn't pay much attention to the craze until I saw a few videos. The game was rumored to be as dangerous as the Bloody Mary challenge, involving balancing two pencils over a piece of paper marked with yes and no, and asking questions to see if the pencil moved. A few friends, Riley, Justin, and Jonah, found the game fascinating and insisted I try it at my place, since I lived alone with my dad, who worked nights. Despite my reluctance to engage in something so unsettling, they persisted, convincing me to give it a try. At first, my friends kept teasing me, calling me a wuss and pushing me to join in. Despite my fear, I eventually gave in, and we agreed to play the Charlie Charlie game at my place on Friday night. We spent the evening eating pizza and playing random games while waiting for my dad to leave for work. Once we were sure he was gone, we set up the game, grabbing pencils and drawing a yes and no on a piece of paper. My friends lit a candle, turned off the lights, and I felt terrified the whole time. They kept joking around, making light of the situation while I grew more anxious. Finally, we were ready to play, and my friends pushed me to ask the first question. Charlie, Charlie, are you there? We sat there in silence, holding our breath, and when nothing happened at first, I mocked them, thinking it was all a hoax. But then, to my shock, the pencil moved to yes. After that, I nervously asked if I could play, but the pencil moved to no, indicating that I couldn't. My friends each asked if they could play, and the pencil moved to yes for all of them. They started asking more and more questions, and at first, it was all fun. But as the questions turned darker, Charlie, have you ever killed anyone? And do you like hurting people? I began to get really freaked out. I couldn't understand why they were asking such disturbing things, and the whole situation started to feel too real. Things took a terrifying turn when my friend Jason asked the game a chilling question. Charlie, should we kill our friend? At first, I thought he was joking, but when I saw the seriousness in his eyes, 
I felt a deep sense of dread. The pencil moved slowly to yes. And suddenly, all three of them turned to look at me with creepy, unrecognizable expressions. Their faces no longer seemed like my friends. They were acting like demons, laughing maniacally with eyes that seemed inhuman. I was paralyzed with fear as they began trashing the room and yelling in demonic voices. When they lunged at me, I panicked and bolted out of the house, running down the street screaming for help. I didn't look back to see if they were chasing me. I was too scared. Eventually, I found a random house and begged for help. And when the police and an ambulance arrived, they found my friends acting erratically in the streets, almost unrecognizable. They were taken to the hospital, and the doctors diagnosed them with mass hysteria. Though I knew deep down that wasn't the true cause. My dad grounded me, thinking my friends and I had been doing drugs, and I couldn't convince him of what really happened. After the incident, I distanced myself from my friends and focused on getting through school. The trauma of that night stayed with me, and I could never shake the fear of what might have happened if they had gotten their hands on me. The story was inspired by a real-life incident involving four high school students who were hospitalized after playing the Charlie Charlie game, with doctors attributing their strange behavior to mass hysteria, though the idea that they were truly possessed remains unsettling. This story is about a frightening experience I had while working as a dog sitter. I came across a post online from someone offering a generous amount of money for dog sitting services. Since the location was close by, I accepted the job, planning to take care of the dog for three days. However, things took an unsettling turn as soon as I arrived at the house. As I approached the door, I noticed a beware of dog sign and caught a strong, unpleasant smell like rotting food. I knocked, and a man's voice called from inside, saying the door was open and inviting me in, followed by the sound of a loud, aggressive bark. Feeling uneasy, I stepped inside, only to find the entryway empty and eerily quiet. I called out, but there was no response, only the sound of a dog's heavy panting coming from the living room. The sound of something approaching grew louder, and I turned, expecting to see a dog. To my shock, a person suddenly appeared, crawling on all fours. I shouted in surprise, realizing this wasn't a dog, but a man in his thirties, dressed in fur-like fabric that covered his whole body, complete with a collar around his neck and a fake tail attached. He greeted me as though he were a pet, excitedly asking if I'd be taking care of him for the next three days. He gave an exaggerated wag of his tail, then crawled over to the kitchen, pointing out special meats that he kept there. Moving like a dog, he opened the refrigerator by pawing at the handle, revealing large, deep red chunks of meat inside. An eerie feeling washed over me, and I took a step back, unsettled by the surreal sight before me. He suddenly ran up to me, slammed his head into my leg, and demanded, are you just going to stand there? Pat my head, pat my head, horrified and confused. I let out a scream as he began licking my hand. The awful smell hit me a moment later, making me feel dizzy and sick. I instinctively pushed him away and bolted toward the door, but he started barking in an unsettlingly realistic way. I kicked open the door and ran, but when I glanced back, I saw him chasing after me on all fours with shocking speed. I shouted for help, desperate, as onlookers stared in shock at the bizarre sight. Before I knew it, he had caught up and was snarling, baring his yellowed teeth and dark gums as he lunged at me. My legs were trembling as a man nearby ran up with a baseball bat, yelling for the crazy dog guy to get back. The maniac bit his leg, prompting him to swing the bat, which made the dog man run away, whimpering like a wounded animal. Shaken and breathless, I watched as my rescuer, who bore teeth marks and bleeding, reassured me it wasn't a serious injury. He explained that this wasn't the first incident. Another young pet sitter had been attacked by the same man, needing 30 stitches. He warned me, if he ever comes after you again, hit him on the head as hard as you can. That disturbing experience was enough to end my pet sitting days, and I occasionally wonder who that man was and what he's doing now.
My name is Kimberly. I'm 19, with light brown skin, brown eyes, and shoulder-length black hair. This happened to me two years ago, on a Friday evening after school. My mom was leaving for work when I came home, and she told me not to wait up for her since she'd be back late. My dad left when I was a baby, so it's just been the two of us since. After she left, I changed into comfortable clothes, made dinner for myself and for her when she returned, then did some chores, locked all the doors and windows, and settled down in the living room with my computer to catch up on shows. A few hours later, I heard the main door open and close, assuming it was my mom. I had my headphones on, so I couldn't hear much, but I suddenly felt someone leaning over the couch. When I looked up, my mom was staring down at me with her eyes unnaturally wide, giving me an intense look. I asked if she was okay, but she didn't respond. Something felt very wrong. She wasn't wearing her usual nurse scrubs. After a moment, she looked up at the ceiling, kissed my forehead with freezing lips, and walked into the kitchen, out of sight. At first, I brushed it off, then suddenly remembered she had told me she'd be home late and had never kissed me like that before. A chill ran through me as I realized something wasn't right. I picked up my phone and called her, hoping to hear it ringing somewhere in the house, but she answered from work, sounding concerned and asking if I was okay. I told her someone was in the house, and she urged me to run to the neighbors while she called the police. I grabbed my things, and as I was heading out the door, I looked back down the hallway and saw her standing there in the dark, just watching me. Terrified, I ran to our neighbor, who let me in and together we waited for the police. When they arrived, they searched the house but found no trace of anyone entering. I stayed at the neighbor's until my mom got home that night. It's been two years since that night, and though we moved a year ago, I never told my mom I saw her doppelganger. The memory still haunts me, and to this day, I haven't shared the full story with anyone else.